Hello and welcome to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. I'm your host, Mark Philpot, and on today's show, I have another incredible guest for you all. So it's a very warm welcome to Anna to the Global Travel Channel podcast show. Anna, welcome to the show. Hello, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting. I started the show about six months ago, and when I first started my podcast show, I thought, right, at some stage, I've got to track down Anna and get her on the show because I always wanted to share your story with everybody because it's so amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> How are you today? I'm good. Good. Thank you. Good to hear your voice. Five years later, I think. <laughs> Maybe more, actually. Maybe. Maybe more, yeah. So um, the story is for Anna and I, we met in Singapore when I was living in Singapore and Anna was had just started her journey and um, I was absolutely inspired by Anna when I met her because I thought, wow, this is a crazy lady from Europe who's riding a motorbike across the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a little bit crazy, but no, for me, it's just normal. You know, it just became my normal lifestyle. <laughs> it did. And uh, I use crazy in a nice way because I think in terms of uh, it's crazy good, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, and I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think this is normal and this is normal crazy, so I enjoy this. <laughs> so whereabouts in the world are you talking to us from today? Um, today I'm in Buenos Aires. I actually arrived a few days ago and uh, I'm preparing my motorcycle to be sent to United States, I think. <laughs> I changed my next destination. United States. Yeah, uh, because I was supposed to, to be back to Europe and then go to Africa, to the West Coast. But now I have some problems with the documents, visas, etc. So for me, it's easier to go to U.S and to ride there a little bit to wait till summertime and to make it till Alaska finally. <laughs> We're going to talk about your planning and everything a little bit later but before we go any further I want to offer you the opportunity to dedicate the show to somebody special in your life. So as my guest who would you like to dedicate the show to today uh, who's someone special in your life? Um, <laughs> you know all the important things in my life I actually dedicate to my father. He's not with us anymore unfortunately but um, this person I think inspired me to all big accomplishments in my life because he always believed in me you know he had this really strong face even much stronger than my own face and myself and uh, actually when I started this journey I, um, I was absolutely sure that this journey is dedicated to him because um, if not his faith in me maybe I would not grow into this kind of person you know who is eager to accomplish mm. things and uh, who believes in my potential my my dreams as well <laughs> so um i would de i would definitely dedicate it to him <laughs> well that's a it's a beautiful dedication i'm sure wherever he is he's looking down upon you and he's um very very proud of you and everything that you're achieving in your life thank you <laughs> Tell us about, let's go right back to the beginning. So what, what got you into riding motorcycles? When did that first start in your life? It started in 2005, so it's almost 15 years ago. And how it started, actually, I cannot explain it even to myself because there was no impulse, you know, there was no kind of uh, impression or by by other people it just uh, one day it came into my life this idea that uh, into my mind that i want to learn how to ride a motorcycle <laughs> but i didn't have any friends who would teach me you know any relatives so i had to go to the riding motorcycle school so that's how it started so just from this inspiration from from above maybe <laughs> But um, I think that it was kind of, it was meant to be because, you know, it brought me on the road around the world, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that that was something that had to, to happen in my life. So it started with those first lessons in the motorcycle riding school 15 years ago, you know. Wow, that's incredible. And wh what, did your th what did your friends think at the time when you started riding a motorcycle? You know, I didn't tell to, to many of my friends at that time that um, I want to do that because for me it would be difficult to explain, you know, because I was so far away from motorcycle world. And of course they would ask me why and for whom or, you know, for what, and I would not be able to explain this. 
And you know what, even for the next few years, my relatives, my aunts and cousins, they even didn't know that I bought a motorcycle and I started to ride. <laughs> <laughs> Because, um, again, uh, the first thing, it would be difficult to explain. And the second thing, they would be extremely worried about me. And, you know, they would uh, keep telling me, be careful and it's dangerous, etc., etc. And I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> so only several years later, uh, they got to know about my new passion. Well, the, the only person who knew was my father, actually, <laughs> and who supported me absolutely in, in everything. So you were able to keep it a very good secret from everybody eh, that you were riding a motorcycle? Yeah, because, um, I mean, we lived quite far away from, from the rest of the family, you know, from the rest of relatives. And uh, then I started to create kind of the new circle of friends, motorcycle friends, you know. And for them, that, that, mm. that was very logic that I'm on the motorcycle because they were the same. <laughs> for the, the sake of my listeners, you're originally from the Ukraine, so you're a Ukraine national. Whereabouts did you learn to, to ride the motorcycle in the Ukraine? And what, what was the very first motorcycle that you were riding? It was a very small 125cc motorcycle, Kawasaki Eliminator, that small chopper. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and I bought it brand new from, uh, from the shop. So, and it was kind of, that was my baby, you know. <laughs> but um, I could ride it only one year because the next year, unfortunately, it was stolen just, just from, from the yard of oh. my house. So I had to buy the second one. <laughs> So, mm. but, and did you get the same one again? Um, it was the same brand, Kawasaki, but much bigger. Uh, it was not 125cc, but 900cc this time. Oh. <laughs> uh, but also that uh, chopper style, or I would say cruiser, cruiser type, Kawasaki Vulcan. Yep. And uh, that, that was actually the motorcycle that I had for, I think, six or seven years. And uh, we started to travel everywhere on this motorcycle. Yep. So it, it has a very special place in my heart. <laughs> Where were some of the places that you went to on that uh, second bike when you went up to uh, the 900cc? Where were some of the trips you took? So first I started to travel in the neighboring countries like Belarus, Moldova, Russia, then a little bit further like... Uh, Bulgaria, Turkey, Romania, those Eastern European countries. Um, then I went to the Middle East countries. That was maybe my biggest pride at that time. Uh, Syria, Jordan, Lebanon. Well, Syria at those times when it was still uh, calm and safe, right? Mm -hmm. So again, now I'm, I'm really happy that, uh, that I made the decision at that time to go there. Um, then also my big trip was, uh, was to India for four months. But I went there by, by airplane and I rented the bike. So, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, th those were the countries mostly like in that part of the world, right? <laughs> Europe, Asia. What did you love the most about riding your motorcycle when you first started? What was the connection you had to the, to the bike and the environment that you were around? You know, for me, it was uh, much more than just riding the motorcycle. For me, it was kind of the learning experience about myself and kind of growing as a person. Because um, before, I, I think that I was very shy, you know, and uh, very disconnected from the people around me. It's just because I, I was really scared, you know, to meet new people, to talk to them, you know, especially to initiate conversation with the new people. And when I started to ride the motorcycle, and especially when I started to go outside of, uh, of my country, right, and, and actually even of my part of the world, I had to meet new people, I had to talk to them, I had to kind of resolve some issues on the road. And I realized that actually I can do that and um, I enjoy doing this. So I discovered some new qualities and some new potential inside of me. And that's actually what I appreciate the most even now, uh, because riding a motorcycle is much more than just uh, covering the kilometers. For me, it's been always mm. much more than that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you first started riding, were there many women in the Ukraine in that area riding motorcycles at the time? Um, not many. Even, even now, I would say there are not so many of them. But every year, of course, the number is growing. Yeah. But at that time, of course, we were much, much less in number. <laughs> Mostly, mm. it's, it's still the, the, the man's world, I would say. <laughs> Well, I think it's quickly going to change because uh, people like you that are doing these trips are inspiring a lot of people and particularly a lot of young girls to get out there and uh, see the, yeah. the beauty of riding a motorcycle. 
Now, you went to India, you rented a bike and you did that trip. Was was that one of the trips that kind of planted a seed in your mind that you wanted to go off and explore the world on a motorcycle or, or was there something else that did that? I think so. Um, actually, uh, when I was flying back from India to back to Kiev, uh, sitting in the airplane, I already uh, made a plan that once I'm back to Ukraine, I will start preparing for this tr big trip around the world. Uh, because the thoughts about this trip uh, started even before my trip to India, but I was kind of scared, you know. And um, at that time, I was thinking about two years of traveling. And for me, it seemed extremely like long <laughs> trip. <laughs> and I was scared that I would not be able, you know, to make it. Um, so that trip to India, which lasted four months at that time was uh, was the longest. And I made it through and I enjoyed it. And I realized that I can be far away from home for so long. And uh, yeah, I can be on the road. <laughs> So uh, coming back from India, I decided that, yes, I will go for it. I will go for that next big trip. <laughs> so how does someone go about, if someone's listening to the show today and they kind of think, well, you know, I'd really like to ride a motorbike around the world. How do they go about planning that? Uh, you know, it's a good question. I really don't know how to do it. Um, I mean, it took me more than a year to, to kind of to prepare and to make all the planning. Um, well, first of all, looking for sponsorship, which I failed. <laughs> Eventually, uh, then collecting information, like looking for contacts, making the route, etc., etc. But you know, when you start this kind of trip, all this planning is, um, uh, I don't know, I, I cannot say that it, it's not helpful at all. But I think the first thing that you have to learn is to be flexible and uh, to change your plans actually once you start the road, because you cannot foresee everything that can happen and even, um, I don't know, even half of that. <laughs> So um, I really don't know. I really don't know. The planning is important, but um, you just have to realize that uh, you'll, you'll just have to, to go with the flow and to, to resolve the issues right at the spot. <laughs> you know? Because you don't know what is waiting for you around the corner and you will never know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In that planning phase uh, and you were thinking about the type of motorcycle that you wanted to ride, was the... Uh the cruiser that you already had was that a consideration or did you realize that you had to get another kind of motorcycle to do this trip um at the beginning i didn't consider that cruiser uh not because i didn't like it but because it was getting older you know i was already like seven years old and i also realized that the cruiser type maybe is not the best bike for, for traveling around the world but of course i could not afford to buy a new bike so i was looking for um, for sponsorship Kind of, you know, and um, I try to talk to, to all the brands available in Ukrainian market, you know, to all the offices. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. well, I didn't have much success on that. And um, at some point, you know, when I knocked the all closed doors, right, I started to consider actually my old bike because uh, there was no way that I would give up, give up on my dream, right? So I had to start anyway on some bike and because I had my Kawasaki available, so that, that would be the option. Uh, but yep. eventually KTM showed up and uh, I'm very happy with that. <laughs> so what was the uh, early discussion with KTM? Because I'm very interested to know what made them uh, finally step up and say, yes, we're going to support you on this. Did they, did they see it as a great global marketing opportunity? Um, you know, initially I didn't talk to them directly because in Ukraine there is a small dealership, KTM dealership. So uh, actually uh, they contacted me uh, initially, um, at the beginning because they knew about my project that I'm looking for the motorcycle. And uh, they told me that, uh, well, they cannot help me personally with the bike, but um, they can start talking with the main um, office in Austria. So because I didn't have any other choice, right? <laughs> and I didn't know much about KTM, but at least th that, that was kind of some kind of opportunity. So I said, yes, let's, let, let's start doing this. And so they started to talk. I prepared a kind of a business plan, like my idea, what, what, I'm, what I want to do. And they started to talk and it took around five or six months, actually. It was long and I started to lose hope, you know, <laughs> and I thought that nothing will come out of it. Mm -hmm. And eventually um, they said yes. I mean, they, they didn't provide me the bike, but they gave me a very good discount, like 50% discount for the bike. And uh, yeah, that, uh -huh. that was the start of our relationship with KTM. <laughs> 
Fantastic. And what, was there many other uh, sponsors coming on board in the beginning when you when you first started the trip? No, no, unfortunately not. And as I said, uh, in terms of sponsorship, I actually failed <laughs> because I, I was approaching many companies uh, in the motorcycle business and outside. But I don't know, maybe um, I just didn't have like proper skills in negotiating, you know, <laughs> or maybe they were not really interested in that kind of project. Or I just, I could not inspire them, you know, or impress them. I, I really don't know. Now I believe that you really need certain like marketing or negotiating skills. I, I didn't have that. <laughs> mm, mm. So maybe that was the reason that um, I couldn't find many sponsors. Just a few of them that helped me with, uh, with some products, you know, service, but not with the cash that you really need for the trip with this. So um, eventually when I started my trip, I had uh, just $1,000 mm. in my pocket mm. and I didn't tell anybody because of that, because I, I felt kind of ashamed, you know, <laughs> and I knew that um, when people will know that I start two years trip around the world with $1,000, that would seem in incredibly crazy. Right? <laughs> So I just wanted to keep it for myself and um, I told to myself, if it's meant to be, it would be. I will somehow, I will find the resources on the way. If not, then okay, I will have to go back to Ukraine. We'll see. So, well, here I am, six years later, still on the road. <laughs> <laughs> I remember our conversation in Singapore and when you told me about the $1,000, I was like, wow, this is really extraordinary. But I also knew that you were going to do it because there was no way that the money thing and talking to you, one of the things that came across was the money thing wasn't even important. It was, it was, you were going to find a way to do this. This is what you were going to do. And to a large extent, the universe has looked, looked after you, right? So thank you so much for facing me at that stage, <laughs> really, because I, I, um, I don't think that I really had that face at that stage that I will continue much longer. You know, I really wanted, but I was not sure that I could make it. Well, now I can see that, that I made it. <laughs> maybe you're a better salesperson than you think you are. I don't know. Maybe, uh, or maybe it's just um, just trust into the universe, the kind universe. You know, I think that that's what matters yeah. actually much more than um, sales skills. <laughs> yeah, true. Now, before you left on the trip and you had everything planned and you had your new motorbike, what did you have any fears about taking on this trip? Was there, was there anything that you were particularly concerned about, like safety or? your own personal security? Um, yes, I had a lot of fears, but mostly uh, because of this money issue. You know, I, I didn't care much about safety. <laughs> well, I cared, but um, uh, it would not stop me by, by any means. But that, uh, you know, that $1,000 only in my pocket, that, that really scared me a lot. So that, that, mm. was, that was the main thing, I would say. And still is, I have to be honest. <laughs> But, but now probably I have more trust, yeah, in the universe, mostly. <laughs> We're going to try and help that. So if this podcast show is going out to 84 countries around the world, people listening to the show today. Wow. So hopefully we're going to get people inspired by and support you in all kinds of different ways. But we are going to talk about the way that people have been supporting you on the trip because that's been a, a wonderful thing to watch. But let's get back to the beginning of the trip. How did you choose where to go to first? What was the plan there? Um, well, I decided to go like east, east side first, like through Russia, Asia, Australia, Americas, Africa. So yeah, that, that was kind of initial direction and kind of the initial list of, um, of countries. Um, there was not much motivation behind that. I just, you know, I looked at the, um, at the routes of other travelers before and I saw that it's quite, um, yeah, quite logic for me to, to go that side. I was going to ask you about that. I was going to ask you if you had done a lot of research on people that have ridden motorcycles around the world and whether you took a lot of their advice on board. You know, I talked to, to a few people. Um, I talked even to the lady who is still a um, Guinness record holder, Ben Capulco. I'm sure that you know about her, right? Yep. And um, yeah, and it was really inspiring because um, like I just sent her a quick message on Facebook and uh, well, at that time I, I didn't have like many impressive trips like so, um, so I even didn't think that she would reply to me, but she replied, you know, and um, we had a nice talk and she supported me a lot, like uh, inspired. She, she told me that I can make it. And actually that was really like, um, like great help to me. 
And also I talked to a few other travelers and um, to one Ukrainian guy who also traveled around the world, uh, Valery Krishin, and he also gave me some tips. But um, I cannot say that I talked to too many travelers actually. No, just to a few of them and that was enough for me. So, mm. and even, you know, like when people ask me, was there anybody who actually inspired you to, to do this trip around the world? I'm saying no, that the biggest inspiration was uh, kind of my previous trips and that passion that started to grow inside of me, passion for traveling. That was my greatest inspiration, not people. <laughs> do you remember the first day you left home? Yes, yes, that was really a big day. Um, and uh, I had kind of official start from Kiev, <laughs> you know, from... Uh, yeah, and uh, it was actually, um, it was on in all the newspapers and TV, you know, and many journalists to, like, to, to do interviews. <laughs> and many people came to say goodbye and even accompany me to, to the exit from the city. And that, that was really, really impressive. And I kind of feel, felt very touched and emotional, you know, really happy. And um, yeah, I don't know, I think that's... Maybe a few thousands of people even came, can you imagine? So I, I felt like a, like a really important person, you know? <laughs> well, that first day um, I made it maybe 100 <laughs> kilometers just to the next city in Ukraine. And already the next day I crossed the border uh, with Belarus. So I would say that only the second day was mm. kind of the, the real start of the journey, of the, of the solo journey, I would say. <laughs> was the sun shining on the first day? Yeah, it was a good weather. It was a really good weather. 27th of July, that was just the summertime. And for me, this day is, mm. now is much more important than even my birthday, I would say. <laughs> I always yeah. celebrate it. The beginning of the rest of your life, I guess, in terms of that particular yes. day, right? Yeah, yeah. Now my life is divided into two parts, before and after. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> what were some of the first challenges that you came across being on the road by yourself um, in terms of just surviving every day? What were the things that you maybe hadn't realized that you had to overcome, but they started coming up all the time? Can you share some of those things? Again, I think that the, the first challenges, again, were connected with finance because I knew that uh, I had to save like as much as possible and just, you know, to spend only a little bit maybe for food, for petrol. That's why I always had to search for hosts, you know, for people that I would be staying for free, you know. So this money issue was always on my mind, you know, that was quite stressful, um, especially at the beginning, because it, can you imagine having $1,000? And every day you have to count, okay, and how, how much is left for today yeah? and how much I can spend tomorrow. So that was really on my mind. There was a lot of pressure. All the rest was kind of fine because when you just, when you hit the road, when you start rolling, mm. just everything is falling into place. You know, you just make a planning from, from day to day and it's, it's just fine. And you resolve the issues right at the spot. And now, you started to stay with people along the way. You started a very active uh, Facebook community. Was, was that something that you had planned, that you were going to put your journey out there and just see how many people would support you along the way? Yeah, kind of from the very beginning, I was quite active on social media, on Facebook, and because um, the first country was, um, was Russia, like neighboring country, with, uh, with many clubs and people who started to follow me like on Facebook even before I started my trip. So I already had initially some, some good contacts and more contacts started to, to show up on the way. Yeah, so that's how it works until now. And what happened when you didn't have somewhere to stay for a specific night? What was your plan then? Well, I had a tent with me and uh, there's always an option of um, like small hotels. So yeah, just, but mostly like, especially at the beginning, mostly I stayed with the people and there was no problem to actually to find such people willing to host you. And, and I was very impressed with that. Uh, but then I started to realize again, mm. that, um, that, that it can be a little bit tiring as well, because uh, staying with people is, it's a kind of, uh, it puts a lot of obligations on you as well and uh, a lot of 
it's time consuming and you don't have time on yourself, on writing for Facebook, etc., etc., and uh, many other issues as well. <laughs> but at the beginning, I didn't realize that and uh, I completely mm. enjoyed have it. Have you got tired of telling your story over and over again every time you stop somewhere? Actually, I enjoy telling my story, you know, and I enjoy answering questions. But the thing is that um, after a while, you don't have time for yourself at all. You don't have time to contemplate on something or just to be on your own. And I'm like an introvert type person and I need more time to recharge my energy on my own, not with people. And uh, I just realized that um, that I don't have it anymore. And I start to, to lose my energy. Uh, I start to get tired more easily because of that. So right now um, I'm trying to, to spend more time on my own. And if I have a chance to, um, to stay at some place on my own, I would prefer that, that option. <laughs> Did you have a plan on how far you rode every day or how did that work out? No, not really. I never have like an average mileage for a day. It depends on where I want to go. Like um, if the next place that I'm interested in is only 100 kilometers away, so it would be 100 kilometers away. If there is nothing like for the next 500 kilometers or this area is not safe and it's better to, to cross it as fast as possible, then I would, will do 500 or 800 or even more. You know, so there is no average for day. <laughs> As I said, it's uh, it's not just about riding; mm -hmm. it's about um, experience and emotions and uh, enjoying the the road and the whole experience of on the road. You've been on the road now for six years, over six years, and being on a motorcycle is something that's very much connecting you to nature every day. Have you had more wet days than sunny days, or have you had more sunny days than wet days? <laughs> Well, I try to choose the areas with more sunny days, you know, because well, I can ride in the rain, yes, but um, if I have a chance not to ride in the rain, I would go for it, you know. And especially, I'm actually, uh, I'm more stressed because of winds and not of the rain. So, you know, just recently I realized that the first thing that I check before hitting the road is the wind speed, you know. <laughs> Sometimes the, the wind direction, because I had really some nasty experiences with that. So, but sometimes, well, you, you just have no choice. You have to go and to be careful. <laughs> so what are some of the most amazing stretches of road that you've ridden on around the world so far in your trip? Well, can you tell us, fellow motorcyclist enthusiasts, where are the best switchback roads in the world? You no, know, there are so many of them. It's very difficult to, to list the, the first top five or top ten. But, uh, and again, it depends on your preferences, right? I would say that my favorite part of the world, because I cannot name just one country, but favorite part of the world is South America. Maybe that's why I'm here the second time. <laughs> um, and I enjoy like everything about it, including the roads, the nature, people, language, music, food, like everything, everything. And uh, talking about the roads, um, I just realized recently that one of my favorite roads is Carretera Austral in Chile. It's, uh, yeah, Patagonia on Chilean side. Yep. I really enjoy it. I've been there twice already and um, it's just, it, it's great. Well, and of course there are many nice switchbacks in Europe <laughs> and uh, some nice roads and nature in Africa yeah. and North America. Well, just all the continents have their own like special things and special roads. So everywhere you can find something, everywhere. Mm. And that's why, you know, the more I am on the road, the more I realize that I haven't seen much and I want more. So I'm getting more and more hungry. That, that, that's really amazing, you know. <laughs> like at the beginning when I started, I thought, wow, um, I've seen so much. Uh, I'm kind of, uh, <laughs> I'm super traveler. But now I'm thinking opposite, that there are still more and more places that I want to explore, you know, that I want to see and I have kind of, less and less time because I have like a certain kind of point, a certain date that I want to finish finally this trip. And more and more places show up that, that I still want to know. And I realized that maybe I, I, <laughs> I cannot cover everything that now I plan for myself until that date or that month in the year. <laughs> so what is that date? When, when do you want to have this trip to come to well, an end? Well, I would like to finish this trip in maybe in 2021 um, because now my goal is um, to be on the road 3,000 days, right? Like totally. So now it's uh, more than 2,000 days. Right. <clears throat> so around, yeah, I think yep. in, in October in 2021, um, that would be that, that mark. That, that I want to reach and um, 
so probably I'll be back to my home country by that time. But maybe not. If something changes, you know, in my plans, in my mind, then so it's not like a strict plan anymore. I mean, nothing is strict anymore in, in my planning <laughs> and my journey. So if I can see that I don't have enough time to, you know, to, to get to Ukraine by that date, then I will extend probably. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> is 3,000 a specific number for a reason or is it just something you've decided to uh, focus on? No, no, no. It just just something that came into my mind and in this 3,000 days I want to do 300,000 kilometers so just this round numbers you know <laughs> nice looking numbers but again uh, yeah. there are still many issues with that so it can be less it can be more but uh, as, again as I said it's not about the numbers mainly but about the experience and uh, emotions that, that you receive along the way that, that's what matters so if I cannot make it then it's fine I will still enjoy every every day and every second on the road. What have you learned the most about yourself on this trip so far? Oh, many lessons actually. Uh, as I said, being on the road is mostly like life-changing experience in many ways. <clears throat> well, I realized that um, I have actually enough potential to do whatever I want. And, and if any idea comes into your mind, then it's possible to accomplish. So um, now I learned to to be attentive to all the crazy things that come into my mind. <laughs> uh, but also I think that uh, I think uh, that I became kind of maybe more humble because I realized that I'm still on the road, uh, not because I'm super brave, strong and skillful, you know, but because the world is, uh, is so good to me and people around. Um, so I just, yeah, many things depend on you, but many things don't and you just have to trust. Uh, to trust to the world and to the people and I'm extremely grateful to all of them to all the friends and to, to all just random people that I met on the way and it makes me actually more humble yeah um, I realize that sometimes I cannot do much and if I can do it it's uh, this is the privilege and this is the honor that is given to me by the universe so what have you learned the most about the world since you've been out there uh, seeing so much of it? Is there, are there certain things that have changed your perception about the world we live in today? Yeah, that mostly this is a beautiful place. And uh, I also realized that um, all the people everywhere and all the continents and countries, they're actually all the same. And there are more similarities than differences between us because we are all similar in the basic things and basic values. We all want to love and be loved. Uh, we want to have healthy families. We want to have peace in our countries. In this sense, we are all the same. And skin color, the color of the eyes and some traditions, it doesn't really matter. So, and I realized that sometimes for me, it's, uh, it's easier and I get along better with uh, my Muslim friends than with European friends, you know, in, in, in some ways. Mm. Mm. So uh, that maybe this is the, the most important thing that I learned. So that's why now um, I can say that my home is the whole world and I feel like I'm at home everywhere. It doesn't matter which continent or country I'm in. So if you were to give everybody who's listening to this podcast today uh, some advice on how we can all make the world a better place, what do you think we can all do to make the world a better place? Uh, maybe following our heart and following our dreams would, would make the world a better place. Uh, I think so. Because I think that um, a lot of kind of sadness and unhappiness is in the world is happening just because uh, we don't do what we really want to do and we don't let ourselves to open up to our dreams and to follow our heart. And our heart will never tell us something bad, you know, it will tell us only good things. So we just have to, to listen to our heart and to listen again, coming back to this idea of crazy things <laughs> coming into our mind, because maybe this is actually the essence of our dream that, that we have to follow. And this is our mission in life to find out what is this dream, what is this crazy idea? Because maybe it's not that crazy, it's, it's just, something that that we want to do for our life and for ourselves so for somebody who's listening to your story about leaving the ukraine with a thousand dollars in your pocket to travel around the world what advice would you to give to them to overcome their own fears on what's stopping them and the excuses they're making to to change their life oh, i don't know i don't have like ready-made recipes right i would say just do it just make the first step on the way to your dream Again, you don't know what is waiting for you around the corner, so you cannot just make the planning all the way till your destination. 
well, you can, but all this planning will be messed up, <laughs> you know, maybe even in the first day uh, of your trip. So just make the first step and you will know where to make the second one and the third one. And I would say that this first step is the most difficult to make, right? But the second, third and all the following, uh, you will make it. I mean, they are, they are much easier. Just you have to understand that this is really something that you want to do. Because if not, then, then you will be looking for excuses why you cannot do that. But then it means that it's not your dream. Maybe there was some kind of uh, social stereotype that this is something that I do. But if this is not your dream, just don't even try to do that. But if this is your dream, make the first step already now, already today. And you will know what to do next. I'm laughing at myself this morning because I remember back to when I met you in Singapore and we were sitting down talking and I thought this morning... I had never in my wildest dreams thought that I would be speaking to Anna again today on my own podcast show <laughs> from a sailboat in Australia when she's riding a motorbike around Argentina. That's just something I would never have dreamed of back then, yeah? You see? Yeah, and it's happening. <laughs> and it's happening. <laughs> it's like with many, many other things in our life, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, every morning I just wake up with a lot of curiosity. What will happen today? What kind of people I will meet? What kind of experience I will get? Because life, even though it's sometimes it's stressful and difficult, but it's extremely, extremely interesting. <laughs> mm, indeed. Now, I'm sure everybody listening wants, to, wants me to ask you this question. Have you had any accidents yet on the motorbike? Well, I had a few falls, you know, and the bike is quite heavy with a lot of luggage. So sometimes I just lose control or lose the balance, especially if the road is a gravel or sand. But uh, thanks goodness, uh, I didn't have like any severe accidents or, you know, I didn't break anything on my body. <laughs> Maybe just a few bruises, but mm. that's it, luckily. But uh, again, I'm extremely careful and uh, I turn my head around always, you know, because I realize that my safety and my health and my life, this is my own responsibility. So my, my main goal is to survive, you know, and well, so far so good. <laughs> so you haven't had to uh, experience any hospitals or emergency uh, facilities anywhere around the world? No. No, thanks goodness, no. Sometimes I visit hospitals, but just for quick checkups or dentists or like some vaccination going to Africa, you know, something like this, or checking my sight, which is dropping recently. <laughs> but I mean, uh, no emergency, no surgeries, nothing like that. Again, thanks goodness. The world and the universe is too, too good to me, too kind. <laughs> this is an opportunity for you to give a good promotion for KTM. How's the bike performing? Has it been good all the way? Well, it's been good uh, for most of the parts. And um, yeah, I try to be good to the bike as well, like regular maintenance, uh, replacement of, uh, you know, oil and other goods, etc., etc. Well, just recently, uh, well, I've been in Brazil and it was extremely hot. <laughs> so the bike, um, I realized that doesn't like it too much. So I had a few problems with the fan, with the cooling system. Uh, but uh, now everything is fine and it's because I'm moving to United States so we will have a thorough checkup there at the main KTM office as well but um, no so far so good and uh, I'm really happy with the bike it, it became my friend you know it's much more than the vehicle uh, accompanying me around the world it, it's really my friend and my house my my family I, I don't know my everything and actually the only stable thing in my life at the moment because everything is changing you know the roads people like everything except the bike <laughs> so so it has a really special place in my heart <laughs> what's your favorite item on your bike Maybe my my GPS because that's how I can I can go actually. <laughs> Otherwise, I would I would be very lost. Yeah, sometimes even with GPS I'm lost. But <laughs> has the GPS been totally accurate everywhere you've been? No, of course not. Sometimes actually I am lost. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, but I try to be careful as well. But sometimes when you're lost, that's also part of adventure, and it brings you to some interesting destinations, and you meet some interesting people. So again, mm. what is meant to be will, will, will happen in any case, even with GPS. <laughs> what do you wish you had on the bike that you don't have on the bike for this trip? I don't think that I would want something on my bike that, that is missing. But uh, outside of my bike, I would like to have a drone, maybe, you know, to, to film myself from above. <laughs> Not just myself, but just the sceneries. But this is something I work on um, at the moment. Um, 
just to, to make my videos more better and more, more impressive, I would say. But, well, this is not part of the bike, but part of riding on the bike, I would say. Well, it's part of the journey. And I was going to ask about that. How has been that whole experience of sharing your journey through social media? Has that been something you've really enjoyed doing? And is that something that you've grown into as well on the, on the whole trip? You know, for me, this is, well, uh, I do enjoy doing this, uh, sharing the photos and stories. and But also it's a kind of, uh, it's a work as well that you have to dedicate your time and efforts. And sometimes I don't have that enough and it's becoming stressful as well. You know, because I realized that um, I have to do that. I have to update my followers. And actually, that's how I can continue, like, my trip. And uh, again, staying with people, it just sometimes um, occupies all your time. And you don't have enough time for other things. And also, especially when we are talking about making videos, uh, well, that's, uh, that's a lot of frustration for me. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't have anyone who would help me with that, you know, with editing, etc., etc. So, and it takes a lot of time, you know. So, um, I'm always behind and I have just a few videos on my channel, but um, I'm trying kind of to organize myself and to discipline myself to do it more often. But that's something that, uh, as I said, frustrates me. Uh, the same was blog, you know. So, um, my main concentration now is Facebook and Instagram, but I don't have much time for blogging and for making videos. And I really wish that I would find a kind of a team or at least some some people who would help me with that but so far only i'm responsible for all, for all that and um, i do all the all the editing and posting and uh, yeah sometimes i wish i uh, i would have more time for that <laughs> well there's a good opportunity for a shout out to all the listeners today if there's anybody out there that is in a position where they're able to give anna some support in doing those social media yeah. editing roles and all the rest of it, then you'll better get in contact with her via the links that I put in the show notes today. So um, I'll put all the details there about uh, Anna's website and her Facebook page, and you can get in contact with her if you can help her out with that. That'd be a great help, I'm sure. Now, what about... Yeah, thank you so much. What about uh, ever going back to a normal life? Can you ever do that, do you think? Or what's going to happen when you get home yeah that's interesting question <laughs> and uh, you know now i'm doing second trip around the world right so this is second circle and it was not my i mean it, it was not in my plans um initially and when i was when i was already in europe like last year and i was about to finish my trip and go back home i realized that i'm not prepared for that okay i, I will go back home and then what i realized that it would be much more difficult for me to stop than to keep going and uh, that's why I decided that um, I will just continue. <laughs> I will go for the second circle and I will go for that goal of 3,000 days and maybe breaking the Guinness record on the longest journey by the solo female traveler, you know? But that was, I would mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. I, I have to confess now and I can't do that. that. That was more like an excuse for me just to continue traveling. And while traveling the second circle, now I start to think more and deeper into my life after after this trip. You know, what I will do, what I will be occupied with, where I will stay, uh, something like this. Because um, I think that many travelers just don't give it much thought what they will do afterwards. But this is a, this is a kind of a problem because when you're on the road for several years, then it's... it's uh, it's a huge change just to stop and settle down. And um, for me, it would be really difficult. <laughs> I realize that that's why um, almost every day I kind of uh, dedicate a few minutes to just to, to contemplating on the life afterwards, after this trip. But I realize that I will keep traveling all my life, um, but maybe not in this kind of non-stop mode, right? But uh, I will want to settle down mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. just to do shorter trips to, to, the, to the places that I haven't been yet or I want to visit again. Yeah. But I'm sure all my life will be about, about traveling in this or that way. Maybe not always on the motorcycle and some other vehicles, but traveling is something that I will never stop doing. <laughs> How many marriage proposals have you had so far? Oh, <laughs> um, no, quite a few. I would say quite a few, <laughs> but most of them were m most of them were, I think, jokes because 
<laughs> uh, I don't think it's it's uh, it's a really easy decision to to marry a lady like me who is always on the road um, with the wind in her hair. Right? <laughs> How has that part of the trip been for you in terms of having? that kind of a relationship with someone that is is that something that has have you had that experience on the road or is it just that this is all about your life journey and your I guess living that dream for yourself have you been able to share it with anybody at all well um I had a couple of those experiences because we are all humans right and including me <laughs> I'm not just a motorcyclist first of all I am uh, I'm a woman I, I believe so <laughs> that this is the first of all um, but yeah, but being on the road, uh, it's, it's quite difficult and most of these kind of relationships are long distance relationships, right? And I don't really believe much in that. So in my case, it didn't work, at least didn't work yet. <laughs> we'll see, there is always a hope. But uh, this is something that is actually, that is missing and sometimes that, um, that gives you some lonely thoughts or some down moments um, and again this is part of adventure because sometimes you just have to to set up priorities and to, to make a choice either um, you continue traveling like this or you stop and build a family make a house etc et have you ever wished that you had a partner traveling with you um well you know um this i would say that this project of, of traveling right now uh, it's a, it's a solo project right so um, I prefer to travel alone and for me it's easier and this is actually part of the project as well because as I said I will try to to set up the new Guinness record on the longest um, solo female travel right so I have to be solo <laughs> and actually I prefer to travel alone because um, um, I'm not um, kind of I don't feel pressure to you know, with the speed or, you know, with stops. So I do whatever I want. And uh, for me, this is my freedom that I don't want to sacrifice for anything. Do you ever get lonely? <laughs> yes. Yes, I do. I do. But um, also, um, kind of, I'm learning to, to become, like, a better friend for myself, you know? Because really, um, the... Like the main source of happiness and of everything is inside of us. It, it doesn't depend on anybody around us or in any circumstances. So this is something that I'm still learning. Um, but um, I think that I am on the, on the right way. <laughs> so for any young girl out there listening to this podcast today and they have a dream and they want to go and live that dream, what would you say to them regarding all the fears? Do it, but you have to be sure that this is really your own dream and uh, it's not uh, the dream of, of your parents or of the society that thinks that you should do this way and this is not something that you want to do to impress somebody, you know. In, um, in your circle of friends or relatives or whatever. Just first you have to identify what is your dream and what is, what is your wish. And if this is really your like wish, true wish and not fake one, then just do it. Then just uh, make the first step, then the second one, and you will know where to go. Because, uh, again, this famous phrase, right, uh, that the world will open its doors in front of you, uh, if you really wish something and don't give up. So if this is your true wish, you will see that the world is just helping you in many, many ways. Um, all you need is trust and uh, to let the world do that for you. At least I experienced that in my, in my life. What were you doing for a job before you started this trip? Well, I worked in the bank. <laughs> <laughs> I was a no normal office worker. Yeah, now it sounds a little bit funny. Um, I was a human resources manager. And um, yeah, for, for many years I worked in the bank, then in one NGO, also in human resources management sphere. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, I enjoyed it at some point, but I realized that this is not something for me and um, I just have to, to get out of that. <laughs> and especially when I, um, when I experienced that, that passion of traveling, um, I realized that the, the, this, is, this is my life, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy that um, I took that decision, radical decision, you know, to quit my job and to, to go traveling. What did your colleagues think at work when you told them that you were going to do this? 
You know, actually, they supported um, in the bank. Luckily, my CEO, my, my boss, was a biker also. <laughs> he was also riding motorcycles. So when I announced that, um, well, he was surprised in a way, yes, but uh, he supported also as well. So actually, even that bank became one of my very few sponsors, like little sponsors. <laughs> and uh, with that amount of money that, uh, that I received from that bank, um, I could pay for that 50% um, that, that I had to pay for the bike for, for KTM. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Okay, yes. so that all came yeah. together very nicely. So what and where is your favorite food in the world? Where do you like, <laughs> what kind of um, cuisine do you like eating the most now after all your different food you know, experiences? I just like food. I like to eat. <laughs> because sometimes, especially at the beginning, when you have to save a lot, you, you, you eat little and very simple food. So I just realized that when I have a chance to eat nicely and a lot, I will eat even maybe too much because you never know when you will <laughs> eat next time. So I, this is something that I actually learned in this trip to appreciate every small piece of bread, you know, and that was sometimes even funny. Like sometimes I'm collecting food, you know, for, for the time when I will be hungry, you know, and sometimes I'm collecting the small pieces of bread or you know, sandwiches or, you know, s small food, because uh, I understand that I appreciate everything. I cannot say that I don't like something uh, of food. I like everything as long as it's fresh, then, then it's fine. This is delicious. But um, again, if I could choose, for example, like, like now what I would want to eat, my favorite food maybe is seafood. Yeah, like shrimps and uh, fish and everything, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. So this is my maybe preference, but um, I can eat everything and I enjoy everything. And in every country, I like to try the local cuisine, even if it's something weird, you know, <laughs> or something that maybe other people would not do. But um, yeah. I try to, to try everything <laughs> and to enjoy everything. Have you got very sick from upset stomachs or in regards to food and water while you've been traveling around the world? Thank goodness, no, not in this trip. Before, when I was in India, I had a few kind of poisonings. Um, but in this trip, I don't know, luckily, no. And some of my friends say that maybe I, <laughs> I can eat stones because my stomach is, you know, it's so used to everything. So, But of course, I try to, to eat only fresh food. And uh, with that, you will not have any problem. But yeah, I try to be very careful with, mm. with water and with the quality of food. But so far, so good. Is pollution a major problem around the world? Have you seen a lot of pollution on the roadsides as you travel around? Yeah, of course, especially in the big cities. Well, uh, recently I tried to avoid big cities, but sometimes you just have, have no choice. Uh, but, uh, well, and riding through Amazonia, just recently, maybe two months ago, um, I've seen some fires also, and that was quite, um, yeah, quite sad to see that. But, uh, well, what can you do? <laughs> What can you do? So if I was to try and make you tell me the favorite place you've been to so far, where would you say that is? I don't have favorite places, you know. One place, Again, give me one place. <laughs> after you've seen so much, you're going to just pick one place because there are so many of them. But um, again, as I said, my favorite part of the world is South America yeah, and all of its countries. Mm. But like recently, um, I just came from um, from Brazil and was very impressed with Amazonia, um, with some small roads and you know the the, the forests. So uh, okay, if if you want me to, to pick just one place right now, <laughs> I would say Amazonia. But I cannot say that this is the only favorite place in the world. Like in every country in in every continent, I have very special places for me. Just because it, it's very recent, I, I just came from Amazonia, so I would say that this is Amazonia. <laughs> and uh, this time I discovered Brazil for myself and really in a better way. Because the first time I've been there, I, I just covered the south part and I didn't spend much time there. And now I spent almost six months. And um, I think that I've been, to, not, of course, not, not everywhere, but to many, many places. And there is also one very special place in the north. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Lensois Maranhão. Uh, these are dunes with small lagoons, small lakes. That, that's really impressive. I would say that this is a very unique place in the world that I haven't seen before anywhere else. Now, you've got a special story to share quickly about 
getting out of Brazil because you had a little bit of a challenge there. Can you quickly share that story with us? Yeah, as I mentioned, I had um, like a small, well, not a small, but an issue was the cooling system of the bike. And uh, we had to order some spare parts that were not available in Brazil. So we had to order them from, from another country, well, from Colombia. And uh, we sent them by the fast, uh, fast DHL. <laughs> I thought that it would be fast. But um, eventually I received the parts uh, one month later because uh, the parts arrived to, to Sao Paulo and they were stuck at the customs for, for seven, like more than, more than two weeks. And that was really depressive for me because, um, well, I could not ride, I could not do anything. So all I had to do was just, you know, just sit and wait. But that was another kind of learning experience for me. I realized that I, I cannot control everything. Uh, sometimes you just have to be patient and ju just wait. This is the only thing that, that, that you can do. Well, eventually I received the parts and here I am in Buenos Aires. So this is my last destination in South America and uh, I'm waiting for, for the new, new part of the world. <laughs> so the next stop is the United States and you're going to go there and do some work on your bike and do some riding yes. uh, waiting for the summertime, is that right? Yes, but I think that um, from the south of the United States I will go first to Mexico and I will ride there um, and then uh, when it when it's getting warmer, uh, I will I will go north all the way to Alaska. Yeah, so I think that I will stay in, in the North mm. America maybe six, seven months. Well, we'll see. It's difficult to plan now. Yeah, amazing. Anna, we've rushed through our time together today. It's been so fantastic to catch up with you again. Thank you for giving me your time, first of all, and thank you for sharing your incredible story so far. I'm sure you've inspired many, many people who are listening to the show today. And I would love to have you back on the show at some stage as well. Thank you so much, Mark. <laughs> so um, if you're happy to come back at some stage, uh, you know, next year, we'll get you back. You can tell us, give us an update on where you are and how things are going towards the big 3000. Would you like to do that? Yes, absolutely. Um, I was happy to, to, to talk to you again. And uh, hopefully that next time we'll talk again, not after five years, but much sooner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. So listen, we wish you all the very best. Have a wonderful Christmas Thank and you. Uh, safe travels. And we will speak again soon, Anna. Thank you so much. All the very best to you too. Talk to you soon. Well, there you go. Another reason why I love doing this show, meeting people like Anna. What an incredible woman, what an incredible story, and I'm sure we're all rooting for her to get to her 300,000 kilometers, 3,000 days on the road, one motorcycle, one amazing woman from the Ukraine. Anna, thanks very much again for coming on my show. It was an absolute pleasure having you. If you're looking for more episodes from the Global Travel Channel podcast show, head over to our website at www.globaltravelchannel.com. Easy to remember. And there you'll find all of our previous episodes. We're up to 84 episodes, so check them all out. There's bound to be something there that you fall in love with. There's been so many inspirational guests on my show. Okay, and if you want to download the shows, you can find them on Apple, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, just to name a few, but all the listings are there on the website on how you can download them and play them in your own free time. Don't forget, if you love our content why not share it with family friends or work colleagues we want to get the global travel channel out there to as many people as we possibly can okay that's it for me in this particular episode my name is mark philpot and until next time i want to wish you all a happy and safe bon voyage <laughs>